Well, good afternoon and welcome to our concluding Winter Science Speaks seminar. Saturday is the first day of spring and hopefully we're a little closer to a point where we can be in the same room together. My name is Jeff Schlato, Director of the UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center. To, lo to learn more about Turk, the research we conduct here and around the world, the public education we provide for the local and regional community, and our work with agencies here in the Tahoe Basin, please visit our website, tahoe.ucdavis.edu. You can also find out how to follow us on social media, how you can participate in our activities and help support the work we do. One of the goals is to facilitate interaction, dialogue, and discussion, something that we all know is a lot more difficult with Zoom. So we'll be attempting to address questions at the conclusion of today's presentation uh, using the chat function. So if you have any questions or comments during the presentations, please use, your, please use the chat function and we'll try to get to as many of those questions at the end. Um, before I introduce today's speakers, um, I wanted to just give you a preview of what will be coming up uh, in the next uh, couple of, of months. On March 25th, we have Fran Moore, an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at UC Davis, talking on calculating the costs of climate change. And on April 22nd, uh, Catherine Olmsted, professor of history at UC Davis, will be talking about Conspiracy Theories and American Democracy. Uh, you can find out more about our upcoming lectures uh, by going to the aforementioned website. So today's seminar is remarkably timely. Um, its title is Climate Change Conspiracy, sorry, Conspiracies, plural, where there's smoke, there are conspiracy theorists. I uh, actually have a whole team of presenters today uh, and let me just introduce them and their backgrounds. So Mark Colivan uh, is a professor of philosophy at the University of Sydney. Mark's research focuses on philosophy of logic, environmental philosophy, ecology, and conservation and biology. Tim Smart is a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Notre Dame, Australia. Uh, Tim's research focuses on epistemology, ethics, and decision theory. Um, and Hannah Tierney is an assistant professor with the UC Davis Department of Philosophy. Hannah's work focuses on the intersection of ethics, cognitive science, and metaphysics, and she writes mainly on issues of free will, moral responsibility, and personal identity. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Hannah um, and welcome her and welcome the rest of the presenters. Thanks so much, Jeff, and thanks so much, Heather, for organizing this. We're really excited to get to talk with you all today about some climate change conspiracies. Um, so as a bit of a background, I guess I should say a little bit about the background of our project. So um, Tim, Mark, and I were on a grant in 2019 called Conspiracy Theories in the Information Age with some researchers from Utrecht University. And we got together in Sydney, Australia at the beginning of 20, January 2020 which happened to be at the height of what would become one of the most catastrophic fire seasons in Australian history. And um, we were all sort of horrified at the sort of just level of destruction that the fires were causing in Australia, but we are also becoming increasingly concerned with the amount of misinformation that was being shared about the causal sources of those fires on social media, in the news, and even by politicians. So for example, um, there were widespread reports that high rates of arson caused the catastrophic effects of the, that season's bushfires. And these claims were largely debunked by both the Australian police and fire agencies. But these stories continued to circulate on social media, often with a hashtag arson emergency. And some of them even suggested that climate activists were responsible for the spike in arson. Um, also, despite the um, well-acknowledged causal link between climate change and uh, that and playing a significant role in establishing the conditions that led to the catastrophic fire season. Many people were skeptical of this causal link, including politicians, perhaps most notably the Liberal MP Craig Kelly, who publicly denied the role of climate change and the Australian bushfire crisis in an interview on Good Morning Britain. And the Prime Minister Scott Morrison was also sharply criticized for 
refusing to acknowledge the existence of climate change, although this is something that he's since changed his rhetoric on recently. Okay, so cut to August 2020 when I took a, a job at UC Davis and moved from Australia to the States. And again, I found myself in the middle of a catastrophic fire season, but this time in California. And again, I and all of my colleagues witnessed a flurry of misinformation and conspiracy theories being shared about the causal source of these fires. So some claimed that the fires were deliberately started by extremist groups like Antifa and even extraterrestrials. And there were also claims about the involvement of exotic technology, um, such as powerful lasers, um, call, so-called direct energy weapons. And disturbingly, these conspiracies were not just touted in the dark corners of the internet, but they made their way into mainstream media and even into the political sphere. So Marjorie Taylor Greene, a US representative from Georgia, publicly uh, suggested that the fires were started by these direct energy weapons. And despite, again, the well, uh, research link between climate change and the California fires, a number of politicians denied this link, including perhaps most famously, then President Donald Trump, who stated, I don't think science knows uh, the origins of the uh, fires in California. So we have this dramatic um, analysis, uh, the dramatic symmetry happening. So in 2020, there were these two sort of record breaking catastrophic fire seasons, but on opposite ends of the globe, if they were met with the same kind of conspiratorial thinking and denialism in both instances. And this led us uh, on, our, on our grant to wonder, why is it that, um, that these huge moments in history are being met with this level of conspiratorial thinking? And why do these conspiracy theories spread so quickly um, on, on social media and, other, and in other forums? So we're gonna try to address some of these questions today. So in the first part of the talk, we'll, we'll look a little bit about why people come to believe conspiracy theories, and then we'll explore why these conspiracy theories spread. And finally, we'll um, consider a few interventions that could slow the spread of these conspiracy theories, um, tentatively suggesting one um, promising route to do so. So I will hand it over to Tim now. Okay, great. Thank you, Hannah. So to start with, um, it'll just be worth defining what a conspiracy theory is, just so we make sure we're all on the same page and know um, what sort of views and thinking we're um, talking about. So here's the main definition of a conspiracy theory, which is used on um, in social psychological research on this topic. So a conspiracy theory is an attempt to um, explain the ultimate cause of significant social and political events and circumstances with claims of secret plots by powerful actors. Um, so that's the kind of thing we'll be um, looking at today. And it won't come as any surprise to you that in recent years, we've witnessed just a staggering rise in conspiracy theories. So while there's nothing new about conspiracy theories um, as such, they've rapidly come to play a much more substantial role in our social life um, than ever before. So for one, there's just many more conspiracy theories around these days than usual, and they target all sorts of phenomena. So we have conspiracy theories about the basic facts of anthropogenic climate change and the causes of bushfires and forest fires, but also about the legitimacy of out, uh, le um, election outcomes, about um, the reality and severity of a global pandemic, about the real goals of 5G telecommunications technology and the list goes on and on. And what's more, it seems like the um, the kind of people who are uh, endorsing these conspiracy theories, that group of people is both getting larger and more outspoken. So we're starting to see more democratically elected officials outright endorsing conspiracy theories and spreading them. And sometimes these officials belong to major political parties and occupy prominent roles. And perhaps what's most concerning is that um, many of these conspiracy theories do cause actual harm. So although conspiracy theories have never been harmless per se, in the last few years, they've directly caused a concerning amount of harm. So of course, the deaths in DC on January 6, a huge number of unnecessary COVID related illnesses and deaths at, and all the harm that's associated with delaying any meaningful response to climate change. So in light of this, um, it's natural to ask what's caused this alarming rise in conspiracy theory? And this might be one of the questions that's brought you along today. Hannah, did you want to tick along just one or two slides? Um, yeah, great, thanks. Okay, so what's caused this um, 
alarming rights. How do conspiracy theories go from being um, a fairly marginal curiosity to a serious political force and something which get, which it seems to be gaining more and more momentum every year? Um, so there are a few possible places you might look for answers. And indeed, researchers and um, popular commentators have explored all of these answers. We're just going to be interested in one of these in particular. But you might think that a possible answer is, well, the world's a lot more uncertain these days than it used to be. A lot more people are experiencing anxiety or finding the world a really confusing and strange place as a result of big picture global financial political changes. So maybe the reason is all these changes have made the world confusing for a lot of people and conspiracy theories therefore seem a bit more attractive than they might otherwise. That's one possible answer. Another is, well, maybe conspir conspiracy theories grow because of something to do with the nature of the internet itself. So um, conspiracy theories just seem to really thrive online. So maybe there's something peculiar and strange about the internet um, as a um, bit of technology that's to blame for um, producing and spreading um, these theories. Or another possible answer for why do people believe conspiracy theories is that it's got something to do actually with the limitations and peculiarities of the human mind. And that's the kind of answer that we're going to be interested in exploring today. So according to this view, the best way to understand why people believe conspiracy theories is by taking a closer look at the psychology of conspiracy belief itself. So that is taking a closer look at the personality profiles, the reasoning habits, the intellectual traits, and so on, of people who find themselves believing conspiracy theories, and just trying to better understand the psychological forces that have led them to hold the views that they do. And then within this broad sort of family of answers to why do people believe conspiracy theories, there's lots of bits of psychology that you might home in on. And we're going to be interested in just um, one feature today. And it's one which has played um, a fairly big role in psychological explanations of conspiracy belief. And that feature is called motivated reasoning. OK, so what's motivated reasoning? Well, um, essentially, motivated reasoning is the practice of basing your beliefs on what you would like to be true rather than on evidence or good reasoning. So motivated reasoning is the practice of basing your beliefs on what you would like to be true rather than on evidence or good logical reasoning. Um, it's when your desires end up influencing your reasoning processes so that you get yourself to just believe what you really wanted to believe all along. And a number of researchers in a different, a number of different fields and social commentators have suggested that this is one of the main psychological drivers of belief in conspiracy theories. Okay, so, so far so good. Um, but social psychology has actually produced two pretty different frameworks for thinking about the psychology of motivated reasoning. Both of these frameworks respect the simple idea that um, motivated, is, motivated reasoning is reasoning which has some goal other than arriving at an accurate belief, but they both then fill in the details of these, um, these frameworks in a, in a different way. In particular, what they do is they isolate a different kind of mental state as the source of a problematic influence on our reasoning. And then when you apply each of these frameworks to the phenomena of conspiracy theories in particular, you end up with a pretty different diagnosis of what's gone wrong in someone's reasoning process, and then a different sort of set of recommendations about, well, how could we have some kind of interventions to stop people believing conspiracy theories, or at least to try to reduce their impact. Okay, so the two, the two frameworks are a desire-based framework on the one hand and a belief-based framework on the other. And I'll just take a um, minute or two now to sketch these um, for you to give you a brief overview. Okay, so let's start with the desire-based framework of motivated reasoning. So according to this view about motivated reasoning, motivated reasoning occurs when our desires to reach a certain conclusion interfere with our reasoning process on a particular question. Um, most people don't think this happens directly, um, as though you could adopt a belief simply as a result of deciding that that's what you want to believe. But they think it does happen indirectly, where you want to believe something, that so that has a serious impact on the way in which you reason about a certain question. And then so you end up adopting the belief that you really wanted to have 
all along. So for instance, you might want to end up believing that climate change is a hoax. And so that leads you to actively seek out evidence which would support that view or discount countervailing evidence when you come across that or process the evidence that you like um, in a certain way, perhaps putting more weight um, in it than you really should or emphasizing some of its good features and ignoring some of its bad features or things like that. And all of this ends up leading you towards the desired conclusion that you wanted to believe all along. Uh, just to give you a, another example of this sort of account of motivated reasoning, here's the original experiment that was used to, does, to study the effects of motivated uh, reasoning. This was done in the late um, 80s. So most people have a desire to think well of themselves and most people want to keep thinking well of themselves. Um, and so this study presented a group of people with an article about how caffeine consumption leads to serious health risks. And the result was that those participants who regularly drank coffee found a way to end up having much less confidence in this article than those people who didn't drink coffee. And the explanation for this was because they wanted to find a way to keep thinking well of themselves in particular, thinking that their choices weren't running on any unnecessary health risks. Okay, so that's one way to think about motivated reasoning, the desire-based um, account. Mark will talk a little bit more about this in a second, but I, I take it that it's fairly obvious that this sort of reasoning is irrational. That there's something, if you're reasoning in this way, that there's, uh, there's something going wrong with the way you're thinking through a particular issue. Okay, so the second framework is a belief-based account of motivated reasoning. And this is where things start to get a little bit more interesting. So according to this framework, motivated reasoning occurs when one's reasoning about a particular issue is driven by one's prior moral and political beliefs. This is sometimes called politically motivated reasoning. Um, and one of the researchers who's done as much as anyone to help us understand this phenomenon is a guy called Dan Kahan, who's a professor of law and psychology at Yale. And he's done a number of empirical studies trying to understand the nature and the effect of political, politically motivated reasoning. Sometimes he calls this phenomena um, cultural cognition to capture the idea that someone's broadly political and ethical beliefs, those things which sort of make up their cultural worldview, often influence their reasoning about a whole host of particular matters of fact. And he's particularly interested in the way in which people process information about um, scientific results. So in his own words, he says cultural cognition ensures that individuals end up adopting beliefs about controversial social policies based on their vision of the good society or based on their prior political and moral convictions. So Kahan and his collaborators have conducted a number of studies on attitudes about controversial social policies, including um, he's done studies on um, climate change, the death penalty, abortion, nuclear energy, and concealed carry gun laws. And he's found that in each of these cases, the results um, differ slightly. Um, the results differ across some of these um, cases a little bit, but he's found the same thing in each case, which is broadly that people's assessments of evidence and people's assessments of arguments to each of these policies ends up fitting with their broader cultural commitments, ends up fitting well with their prior moral and political beliefs that they brought to this question. Okay, so this amounts to quite a different way of thinking about how motivated reasoning might feature in the psychology of those who end up believing conspiracy theories. And one really interesting difference is um, between the belief-based framework and the desire-based framework is that on the belief-based framework, it's not obvious that this is necessarily irrational. It's not obvious that this person is um, actually making a mistake in the way in which they're reasoning about a particular issue. It might be the case that someone who's um, engaging in some politically motivated reasoning can be represented as someone who's reasoning, reasoning rationally, reasoning as you would hope that um, someone would. Okay, so just to go into a little bit more detail on this point in particular, I'm now going to hand over to Mark, who's going to talk a little bit more about the, the rationality and irrationality of um, reasoning on each of these frameworks. Great, thanks, Tim. So it's I take it's fairly clear that the the uh, desire based framework is irrational. That is, if you're it's a it's akin to a kind of 
wishful thinking. You'd like to believe in Santa Claus, so you do. It's not, as Tim pointed out, it's not quite as simple as that, but it's akin to that kind of mistake. It's, but it's also important to note that desires have a role to play in our decisions, in our actions. So it's well known, for instance, in standard decision theory, that your actions are a function of both your desires and your beliefs. You don't act upon beliefs alone. You buy a lottery ticket, not because you believe you'll win, you indeed believe that it's very unlikely that you'll win, but the payoff is so great if you do, that's why you buy a lottery ticket. It's not a, 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 not a particularly good example because um, the expected utility in such cases for those who know about these things is stacked against you a little, but there's lots of cases similar to that where it's perfectly rational to, do, to, to act as though something will happen even though it won't. I often take my umbrella to work not because I actually believe it will rain today, but there is some chance of rain and I don't want to get wet, right? So we, we perform actions influenced by our desires and that's indeed the rational model of how you should act. So desires are perfectly fine to play a role in your actions, but not in the formation of your beliefs. Your beliefs should be based on evidence and evidence alone. Okay, so insofar as desires are influencing someone's beliefs, then I think we're quite right in claiming that there's some kind of cognitive mistake going on there. And as Tim flagged, the belief model though is much more complicated. There are mistakes in the vicinity that people could be making, but there is also a rational reconstruction of someone who is looking exactly like someone who's basing their beliefs on desires. So let me just give you kind of simple example here. If someone has uh, the belief that climate change, anthropogenic climate change is incredibly unlikely. And indeed, we all start from a position something like that, you know, 50 years ago, say, it seemed unlikely that human interventions could change the, 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 the climate of the earth. So we all start from a position where we think that this is rather unlikely. For most of us, we've changed our minds because of the evidence that's come in. But if you start from extraordinarily unlikely, for a position where if you think it's extraordinarily unlikely, it's going to take you more evidence to change your views about this. And so if your prior belief, your belief in climate change prior to any evidence coming in, your probability for that, your probability of climate change is very, very low, then it takes a lot more evidence for you to, to switch, right? And that's as it should be. That's precisely as it should be. Indeed, to not do that is a kind of mistake. In fact, it has its own name. It's called the base rate fallacy. This is the mistake of ignoring your prior beliefs and just looking at the, the sort of incoming evidence. Uh, Kahneman Tversky made such mistakes rather uh, uh, prominent in, in psychology and philosophy and literature. So this is basically a mistake of sort of thinking, I, I've, I've uh, got the symptoms We've all done this at sometimes looked up diagnoses online, right? I've got the symptoms of some rare disease, some rare tropical disease. I live in Sydney, aren't too many rare tropical diseases in Sydney. It's extraordinarily unlikely that I have this rare tropical disease, but I look up the symptoms and I find that, oh, I have all those symptoms. And let's suppose the diagnosis via this website is, you know, 80% reliable. Then it's a it's a mistake to think, okay, there's 80% chance that I have this rare tropical disease. You know, the word rare here is important. The prior probability of me having this disease is extraordinarily low. And so even after this evidence comes in and it's 80% 80, 80 reliable that I have it, the probability that I have this rare tropical disease is not 80%. That's, that's the base rate fallacy. And Kahneman Tversky demonstrated that people make this mistake all the time. It's a really, really common, deeply entrenched mistake we make. And what the mistake amounts to is just focusing on the incoming evidence and forgetting about your prior probabilities, the base rates. Okay, so there's a way of thinking about this belief-based framework where the people are doing exactly as they should according to standard accounts of rationality. 
they've got a low prior probability in something such as climate change. I think it's very, very unlikely. They don't ignore the evidence, but they take on board the evidence as it comes in. And it's just not enough to sway them from thinking that climate change is very low probability to thinking that it's, it's higher probability, um, high enough for, to warrant calling a belief. And worse still, you might think in cases like this, where you, what you've got is a kind of conflict between your prior beliefs and incoming evidence, then you should update your prior beliefs. But you also note that evidence can be more or less reliable. So in such cases, you might think that that's good reason to question the incoming evidence. You need to be very careful here, because if the evidence is reliable, then ignoring reliable evidence is a kind of mistake. But if there is some reason to, ignore, to, to be suspicious of the evidence, then again, you're doing the right thing. And, and if this sounds like it's irrational, let me just change the example to something, you know, a bit of personal biography here. I hold a uh, very, very high credence in standard theory of evolution. So when some you know, evidence, um, in scare quotes, if you like, comes in that the, 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 all the bio, biological world that we see around us is the result of an intelligent designer, I don't put much stock in that evidence, whatever that evidence is, you know, sort of pointing out the incredible functional uh, um, fine-tunedness of the, of the individuals to the environments and so on. I could, as a perfectly rational agent, say that the probability of evolutionary theory is rather high, and so there's evidence against it, counts a little bit, but not very much, and it just doesn't shift me from, my, from, from believing in evolution to believing in an intelligent designer. It doesn't sway me. Or... I might just think that that's something wrong with the evidence. And if I were to read through all this literature on intelligent design, I would find fault with it. I know that I would find fault with it, but I can't be bothered doing that because I don't have time. I've got better things to do with my time than be reading uh, intelligent design literature. So am I being rational? Am I refusing to budge from my belief in evolutionary theory and refusing to take on board the so-called evidence coming from intelligent design. Well, you could you could portray that one of two, what you know, either of two ways. One is this sort of belief model that I've just outlined, that I just have a strong belief in evolutionary theory for all sorts of reasons, you know, and this, this new evidence that's supposed to sway me from that is dismissed as unreliable or accepted as reliable but it's not strong enough to sway my belief from evolutionary theory that's the, that would be the belief based framework and that strikes me as perfectly rational what would be irrational for me to say i just like evolutionary theory i think evolutionary theory is cool i do and and that's the reason that i believe in it right and and, and admit sort of in some sense maybe in the dark recesses of my mind that all this intelligent design stuff is really compelling, but I just don't believe it because I think evolutionary theory is cool. That's a, that's a mistake. The problem is from the outside, how do you tell what I'm doing? I mean, even from the inside, it's difficult. I honestly believe that my beliefs about intelligent design versus evolutionary theory are rational. But my behavior here is going to be identical to someone who holds on to evolutionary theory because just because they think it's cool. And I might be fooling myself even. So it's very difficult from the outside and even from the inside to tell whether your, your uh, beliefs in false claims, conspiratorial claims are based on this prior probability of the claim in being so low that you, no evidence will sway you from it, or it's based on desire to believe the proposition in question. So why is this important? Well, what we've got is two quite different diseases here. You know, one of them is actually not a disease at all. It's a perfectly rational way to go forward, or it could be the belief-based model. And you've got this other pathology, some sort of cognitive pathology of the desire-based model, and they look the same. 
they look the same from the outside and they can even feel the same from the inside. And the treatment of these two, and Hannah will talk a little bit about this, more about this shortly, the treatment of the two is gonna be very different. And so we've got this problem of differential diagnosis here of what's going on in this conspiratorial thinking, at least this something in the vicinity of motivated reasoning. And the way we should tackle it are gonna be very different depending on whether it's a belief-based model or a desire-based model. And it's gonna be extraordinarily difficult to tell one from the other. And I'll hand over to Hannah to take on the difficult task of how we might <laughs> tackle that problem. Thanks so much, Mark. Okay, oops. Okay, so in this last part of the talk, we'll talk a little bit about why conspiracy theories spread and then how we can intervene to slow the spread of them. Okay, so let's for a moment just assume that people by and large, when they come to believe conspiracy theories do engage in this kind of rational process where they're not doing any necessarily anything epistemically illicit. I think that's probably not the case, but we can assume it for now. And there's still an interesting question to be asked about, well, why is it that, that so many people come to believe conspiracy theories? Or why is it that so many con that conspiracy theories spread so quickly among social groups? And so even if we think that there's nothing epistemically untoward about coming to believe in a, a conspiracy theory, we still wanna know, well, why is it that so many people come to believe them? And I think the answer, this is, so that's a difficult question to answer, of course, but I think one important element is going to have to do with our social, the social structures that we're in and social media. So with the rise of social media and platforms like Facebook and Twitter, we now have access to much more information than we've ever had access to. And we also have larger audiences with whom we can share information. But these audiences, while they're sort of um, extremely large, are often not extremely diverse. So we tend to gather and share information within groups who are made up of people who are mostly like us in terms of their background beliefs, political orientation, and worldviews. And this has led some people to think that a lot of the information that gets gathered and shared on social media is getting gathered and shared within echo chambers. So it'll be useful to look at a little bit about what it is, what an echo chamber is. So Jennifer Lackey's recent account of echo chambers um, has three important features. So within an echo chamber, there is an opinion that's repeated and reinforced, thereby amplifying it, often through resharing. And this occurs in an enclosed system, a chamber, such as a social network, allowing that opinion to echo. And dissenting voices are either absent or drowned out. So this can characterize a lot of the ways in which, uh, a lot of the structures in which we gather and share information on social media. But I wanna highlight one other element of echo chambers that's missing from Lackey's account, but is um, prominently featured in T. Nguyen's account of echo chambers. Um, and that is a, a asymmetry in trust. So according to Nguyen, echo chambers are epistemic communities which create a significant disparity in trust between members and non-members. And this disparity is created by excluding non-members through epistemic discrediting while simultaneously amplifying insider members' epistemic credential. And according to Wynne, this is actually an important structural feature of echo chambers, such that people within an echo chamber have this belief in the epistemic credit of those around, of those within the, their epistemic, their echo chamber, and distrust those outside of it. So, so in order to get a better sense about how echo chambers um, come to be and then how they can spread conspiratorial thinking, it'll be useful to look at one case study. And for this, we can look to the recent coverage of the QAnon movement. Okay, so um, the QAnon movement began in 2017 and a host of conspiracy theories are associated with this movement, but perhaps the most prominent one is that a group of democratic politicians and celebrities are operating a sex trafficking ring and that Donald Trump is going is battling them actively and will soon reveal the existence of this conspiracy and publicly hold those who are responsible accountable. And the, um, this event was supposed to occur at a number of dates and it continues to change, but there's still people who believe in this one feature of the conspiracy theories as well as others. Now, um, the original QAnon movement started in 2017 on a messaging board 4chan where users, uh, where a user named Q Clearance Patriot um, and eventually just known as Q would post a series of coded messages um, known as Q drops and followers would form groups to discuss these Q drops and decode the messages and sort of um, share, the, their, share the theories that they believed in. Now, I think these original groups um, match are, are good examples of echo chambers. You have a group of people who 
are um, sharing theories that uh, with one another and they're har harshly criticized and block people who don't agree with them. And they, and they become more confident in their theories as they continue to share. And we can look at the spread of these groups over the course of the, of, over the past few years. So the QAnon movement started on 4chan, but in 2018, it quickly migrated to 8chan and Reddit where more and more groups were cropping up, sharing theories with one another and decoding Q's messages. Now in 2018, in March, 2018, Reddit banned QAnon content citing worries about um, inciting violence and sharing personal information. But rather than dismantling the QAnon movement, this actually just caused this, these groups to spread to other more mainstream social media platforms like YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And by early 2018, QAnon content had exploded on these websites. So it, the, according to the ISD, by um, between March and June of 2020, uh, QAnon content was up 175% on Facebook, 77% on Instagram, and 63% on Twitter. Now, it's an interesting question, like why did this QAnon conspiracy theory content start being shared so heavily in early 2020? And of course, one answer has to do with the pandemic where more people were, were um, spending more time online than ever before. But another and more insidious answer has to do with these platforms themselves. So as when QAnon content um, became, got, started to get featured and shared on popular media platforms like Facebook and Instagram, those platforms algorithms actually took a pretty prominent role in sharing that QAnon content and exposing others to that content. And this is something that these social media platforms have known about their, their algorithms for quite some time. So uh, face, in a 2016 internal review, Facebook um, found that 64% of all extremist groups uh, joins are due to their own recommendation algorithms, largely from their groups you should join and discover algorithms. And YouTube in 2018 estimated that approximately 70% of all watch time spent on the site was driven by its recommender systems. And in 2021, a group of social epistemologists presented a model by which YouTube's recommender system could actually um, radicalize users by recommending extremist content to them. So I think this is actually one key way that conspiratorial content gets shared on, uh, get um, why these echo chambers that share conspiratorial content grow on social media. It actually has to do with the social media platforms themselves recommending these groups to their users. So it's not as if people are going out and seeking this content, rather it's being provided to them. And one can come to believe the, um, come to believe these conspiracies using entirely rational mechanisms, right? By trusting people in their social networks and trusting the sources that are providing them with this information. So by mid 2020, uh, the social media platforms realized that they had a big problem with QAnon and there was several attempts at intervention and banning this content. This took place largely in the summer of 2020, but they were largely unsuccessful. So even after Facebook and Twitter committed to getting rid of these uh, groups that shared conspiratorial content about QAnon, there were still hundreds and hundreds of QAnon groups on Facebook some with over 100,000 users and a total of 3 million users engaging in these groups regularly. Now this started to affect the belief profile of the American public as a whole. So you got studies like this showing that a, a less than 50% of people thought it was false that a group of Satan worshiping elitists who run a child sex trafficking ring are trying to control our politics and media. And, and we find similar results for other conspiratorial thinking, like for example, the uh, 2016 election and, and the source of the COVID-19 pandemic. So this started to shift not only, in, this started to shift people's beliefs in the public. And of course it led to um, actual actions as Tim, uh, Tim indicated at the beginning of the talk, the uh, January 6th riots at the Capitol can be linked to a lot of, a lot of conspiracies to sh um, shared on QAnon Facebook groups. This led to a much harsher uh, intervention by these platforms. So YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram took a much more active role in trying to police the content of these groups in at the end of 2020 after the Capitol Hill riots. And I think to a large extent, they were much more successful. So Twitter um, cleared 70,000 users from QAnon users from their platform and Facebook got rid of groups that um, shared uh, share the stop the steal content. But when someone, when even when these interventions are successful and we can, and you can successfully get rid of the content on one platform, this doesn't make those echo chambers go away or that or people who believe or people stop believing in these conspiratorial theories. 
Rather, a lot of these individuals migrated to other platforms, places like Gab and Parler and MeWe and, um, and others. And, these, and, they, and they began to share their conspiratorial theories there. I think that there are a few upshots from thinking about these kinds of interventions with QAnon that we can learn, that we can sort of draw from when we're thinking about how to intervene with conspiratorial content about global warming. So I think there were three big upshots from the, ban the effective bans from QAnon content. One is that they did succeed in reducing exposure to at least some conspiracy theories to the general public. By getting rid of a lot of these QAnon groups on places like Facebook and Twitter, that did make it less likely that an a member of the public would be exposed to those theories in the course of their everyday lives or using those platforms. But it also had a negative effect on the people within those communities. So by when these echo chambers migrated to other platforms that were populated with by and large people who looked even more similar to them and had even um, more overlap in their background beliefs, it makes it harder for others to reach those individuals and to alter their beliefs, not only just to provide them, to even sort of provide them with evidence that could shift their beliefs in a different direction. It also makes it harder for those individuals to get out of those echo chambers without any sort of access to people who don't share their background beliefs. And another important feature of an upshot of this of these bans is that it increases the distrust of the members of that echo chamber of those from the outside. So remember, a key feature of an echo chamber is a distrust in outsiders. And a key feature of conspiratorial content is a distrust in, in people in power. So when the people in power who run these platforms ban a group of people from engaging on their platforms and take away a key source of their ability to share knowledge with one another, that will only serve to increase the distrust of those members to that um, uh, of the of the sort of platforms and other individuals in power. And that could only that could just serve to fuel the conspiratorial thinking that was, that's taking place in those echo chambers. Okay, so what about climate conspiracies? Can we learn anything about climate conspiracy theories from uh, from uh, QAnon spread. Well, one, one thing to note is that conspiratorial content about climate change is not currently being banned on social media sites. It's still being recommended by social media algorithms and people are continuing to be exposed to it via their algorithms through their um, friend groups or through their content engagement. A good example of this is the um, TikTok videos and Facebook posts from about the winter storm in the South. So a month, ago, I guess maybe two months ago now, there was a big storm in the South with devastating effects there as well. But there were lots of videos um, showing people trying to burn snow to melt it and failing to do so. And these were shared as a, as a way to indicate that the government had uh, created the snow in these in the Southern areas. And it was not in fact an outcome of catastrophic global climate change. And these were extremely popular videos. So the one TikTok video was seen over a million times and shared widely. Okay. so. This, this indicates that if there's no intervention, these echo chambers that, were, that share conspiratorial content about global warming are going to continue to grow. And this belief in these conspiracies will continue to undermine responses to climate change unless we do something to change them. Now, I believe I am almost out of time. So I'm going to talk about how to slow the spread of conspiracy theories, but I'm just going to get to the, the intervention that we think is gonna be the most prominent, the most promising, which is not an intervention in changing people's actual direct beliefs about the conspiracies or even trying to change their social networks themselves. Rather, it's gonna be an, an indirect intervention that will promote trust between members within the echo chamber and those outside of it. So remember, even if people are operating rationally, they're not doing anything wrong when they dismiss evidence from people that they don't trust or they continue to believe in conspiracies that are, sh that are shared with people in their echo chamber. But if we can intervene to promote the trust between people within the echo chamber and those outside of it, as well as um, trust in the sort of uh, people in power at large, this could be one way of getting them to be more open to evidence that will undermine their beliefs and less likely to continue to, and less likely for those conspiratorial beliefs to be amplified because they'll leave those echo chambers. Now, of course, this is an extremely difficult uh, task. How do we promote trust between people who really don't trust one another at all? And so how do we do this? And then who's gonna be responsible for rebuilding this trust? Will it be the government? Will it be social media platforms? Will it be members of the community or educators? And then where will this kind of trust um, building take place? Should it be taking place on social media, in our classrooms, at our, in, our, in our communities? These are all really difficult questions, but I think there's a lot of evidence to think that if we don't intervene uh, on the trust, the distrust that takes place between members of echo chambers and people who believe in conspiracy theories, and those outside of their echo chambers, 
we're never going to stop entirely the spread of conspiracy theories. Okay, so I think that's our time. So I can open it up for questions now. Well, um, let me see. I, I'm looking at the chat. Um, so I, I'm encouraging people to uh, to enter your questions via chat, um, via the chat function. Uh, but while we're waiting for that to come up, um, I guess I have a question and maybe it's directed initially to Hannah, but maybe the others as well. Uh, talking about trust at the end, you made it sound as if it's it's just something that we have the power to, to change and affect. I was wondering what you think about the, what responsibility and role uh, companies like Facebook, for example, would have on this. Is there anything we could, is there anything they could be doing that would help the building of this trust or you know, through changing of algorithms, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think so. surely social media platforms have a big obligation um, to intervene in the spread of conspiracy theories, given that their platforms are one of the driving forces of the share of conspiracy theories and their algorithms are responsible for people being exposed to them. But how they can best intervene, I think is a more difficult question to answer. So for example, banning that kind of content, banning conspiratorial content about global climate change might have a positive effect on people not being exposed to that content as much as they would have been otherwise, but it's also going to increase the distrust of people who do believe in that conspiratorial content, um, that their distrust of, of others who are trying to show them evidence about their conspiracies are misguided or the power structures that they take to be responsible for covering these conspiracies up. So it's gonna be tricky to figure out how social media corporations can best intervene. I think one thing to do is to alter their algorithms to stop sharing, to sort of stop exposing people to this information just based on their uh, con other content that they've engaged in or people in their social networks. But that won't be enough to completely stop the spread. We need to do, we need to perform interventions that will enhance the trust between these platforms and the members of the echo chambers. And it's less clear how a social media corporation can do that effectively, at least do that effectively alone. Okay, then I guess switching then, uh, and a couple of people have uh, put in this question, you know, how do you build trust? Uh, it's easy to say, but what are the elements of, of building trust? Yeah, that's a great question. So it, it's also important to note that it's not always bad to distrust someone. So like, as Mark said, sometimes you've got really good reason to distrust a source of information and we should dismiss them and we shouldn't trust them. So it's not like there's something intrinsically or inherently wrong with being in an echo chamber. Sometimes um, if we're in a group of really reliable thinkers that we're just getting better and better beliefs by being in the echo chamber and we have reason to distrust those of outside. So I don't want to say that like trust is like something that we should we should sort of extend to all and all agents. But how do we increase trust between sort of reliable sources and those who fundamentally distrust them? That is, I think, the thing that we have. I think that's the difficult question, but it's one that we have to answer if we want to uh, intervene effectively in these matters. Can I, I just add to that one, one. I mean, one possibility, and Hannah touched on this is rather than outright bans, although I think there's also a place for social media bans, uh, that what you might do is just in the algorithms with the recommendations, you, you, you click on some conspiratorial um, website, say, and you get instantly recommendations for other conspiratorial websites. What would be nice is if you've got an antidote for that as a recommendation, you know, on the other hand, here's some scientific evidence that there is climate change, for instance. You know, of course, the recommendations don't say that. But if you just got recommendations for alternative points of view with no comment, right? You know, what you don't want to be told is your views are crazy. You should read this, you know. Whereas if you're just getting these sort of recommendations, I click on a re conspiracy website and the next recommendation I get is a New York Times article about evidence for climate change. And I'm not being told that 
my prior clicking was wrong and I should be clicking here instead or whatever, just that these are the recommendations rather than currently the algorithms are uh, designed to increase traffic, right? They're not interested in you know, getting people to the truth. So if you click on something, whatever it is, you'll get more recommendations of that kind of thing. Whereas if you, it's, a, it's a not, a, not a terribly difficult change to the algorithm to have uh, contrary points of view as a regular, a regular kind of recommendation. Um, you know, just think about when you buy a book from Amazon, I, I always startles me how reliable those recommendations of other books that they give to me are. But, you know, it would be just as easy to say, okay, so you're interested in this. What about this, which is slightly, you know, rather different, but, you know, uh, those, those sorts of changes may well be at least one, work, one way of worth exploring. Okay. Thank you. So here's one, I guess, a question for any or all of the of the presenters, uh, and it's from somebody who's teaching a class on climate change and sustainability at Berkeley. Um, I guess they've been examining the role of accelerating extreme climate change events as a basis for people to hold on to, in quotes, yesterday, and to deny that such change is happening at all. And so he's asking if any of you have comments about how this this phenomena relates to the desire belief based model that you've all been talking about. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in again then. I, I think it, it, again, it's hard to tell, but which of the two models we're talking about. So someone who honestly just does not want to believe in climate change, and let's face it, we, we would all like it to be false, right? Uh, so it, they, they're not alone there in thinking, you know, it's, wish, it's the wishful thinking, but they, they honestly want to believe that climate change is false. And so they grasp at any piece of evidence. And so, for instance, seeing a particularly bad winter storm, you know, you hear this every time there's a bad winter storm. How could there be global warming when we had the coldest day in January for, you know, whatever? So that. There, there's a there's a confusion there between weather and climate, of course, that we 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 all know about. But they they're pulling out pieces of evidence to support their desire based beliefs. But it could also be, you know, it also sits very well with a belief based model. And so again, if it's belief based, what you've got to do is educate them. For instance, between the difference between weather and climate and that one of the predictions of climate change is that will be more extreme events, both cold and, and hot. And that that sits perfectly well with the, uh, the um, anthropogenic climate change. So again, it depends on knowing whether they're basing this on belief or whether they're basing it on desire. It makes a difference how you're going to tackle it. But I think, it, what Hannah said about trust is right. In both cases, you've got to trust the evidence if it's the belief-based model. Um, and that's a, that's a good start. If they can believe an authority who says that extreme weather events, both hot and cold, are going to be more prominent under climate change. Um, the problem is so many people just don't, even, don't get that or don't believe that. And if it's not believing it, it may well be to do with lack of trust. Christ. I might just also um, add to that in regards to the same um, question that what we were talking about was sort of like, I guess, the main psychological explanation of what's going on in the psychology, psychology of people who believe conspiracy theories, how can we better um, understand that and start to work against it. But there's a whole host of possible psychological explanations, not just motivated reasoning. So it might be the case that the very interesting work you're um, doing is best understood as sort of like something adjacent to um, motivated reason, uh, reasoning, another kind of psychological feature of um, people who believe um, conspiracy theories. Because people do talk about, well, they have these, sometimes people who believe conspiracy theories all have these particular personality um, features, or sometimes uh, some of them might be suffering from um, this or that disorder. So it might be the case that um, what you're talking about 
could be could be sort of folded into some of the motivated reasoning analysis we've been getting into, or it might be um, just another psychological feature that really um, deserves um, thinking about on its own terms. It sounds on the, the surface of it, it sounds very interesting to me. Great, thanks uh, to both of you. Uh, another question here uh, is, I guess, asking whether there's any correlation between acceptance of, of conspiracy theories and educational background out there that you're aware of. Yeah, I know about this one because I was just reading about um, this and it's right across the board, which is very surprising. So um, yeah, studies have found that um, the wealth and education background are not reliable predictors of whether a group of people uh, endorse um, conspiracy theories. Okay, I was expecting that to be a much longer answer, but uh, yeah. you say that's conclusive. Um, well, I, I don't know if it's conclusive. Those are the main results at at the moment. So, you know, the stu studies continue and things like that, but I think the consensus of, um, or the consensus of social psychology researchers at the moment would say that those, those two things, education and um, wealth are not good predictors of whether someone believes conspiracy theories. You get conspiracy belief distributed right across those groups. Well, certainly looking at the data- on Which the is bad. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, which is obviously bad news because what you would like to be able to say is that better educated society will be less inclined to believe these conspiracy theories. And the answer is education. You know, we in the education sector like to say that's the answer to lots of things, right? But it's not clear that it is the answer here, unfortunately. Okay, so there's been, you know, all of you were talking about the internet and internet platforms for disseminating misinformation, conspiracy theories. A couple of questions uh, here are asking about what the role of the traditional media has been in, in either promoting conspiracies or, or denying them or whatever. What is the role? Are they effective at all? Um, so, just like social media has kind of increased the information that we have access to, there's also been a change in sort of traditional media with increasing the number of news programs and news channels that people can uh, engage with. And those two have seemed to dri have driven the uh, echo chamber landscape. So the original work on echo chambers came out of the studies about Rush Limbaugh's listeners in the uh, early 2000s, which is a radio program, right? And so when you see, so you still get this fracturing of um, individuals into communities who by and large share their same background beliefs and that can sort of um, can and can drive a conspiratorial thinking or just sort of um, more uh, confident beliefs in one's own uh, worldviews as well. So I think you see similar problems happening in the mainstream media and whatever social media's obligations will be to stop this spread of conspiracy theories, um, mainstream media will have those same obligations as well. It's also worth noting that conspiracy theories, you know, have been around a long time. It's the, the, the social media boom has had a huge effect. But one of our collaborators, um, Daniel Konitz from Utrecht, on the part of the Utrecht team of this project, he, he's particularly interested in um, one of his favourite examples of conspiracy theories was. Uh, I think 1969, this conspiracy theory emerged that Paul McCartney had died in a car accident around 1967. And there are all these clues embedded in Beatles albums. And he's sort of fascinated with this example because while it was clearly false, you know, it was just any kind of evidence that just listen to the Beatles album, album Abbey Road, recorded in 1969, that's Paul McCartney playing bass, that's Paul McCartney singing, that's Paul McCartney singing, There's nothing clearer. But they were supposed to have got a, a look-alike who could play bass, sing and write songs just like Paul McCartney. And there were people who took this seriously. And it's, you know, 
and looking for clues in the Beatles albums then became a kind of enterprise in its own in its own right. But what what I think is particularly interesting about this case, firstly, it's pre-internet. And secondly, it wasn't something you found in mainstream media. It wasn't like, say, the conspiracy theories around John F. Kennedy's assassination, right? Any story about John F. Kennedy assassination was newsworthy. So even the conspiracy theories got, uh, uh, you know, a great deal of traction in the mainstream media. But the Paul McCartney is dead conspiracy theory, I, 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 from, I think it was spread mostly by... Um, you know, fan newsletters and things like this, really sort of very, very non-mainstream media, if it deserves to be called media at all. And yet it spread. It was around the world. Everybody, you know, at the time knew about this, this Paul McCartney's dead. And still, you know, still a sort of jokingly, he gets this question raised in interviews to this day. <laughs> so it, it really became quite well known prior to the internet and without any uh, endorsement from mainstream media. And that can go on too. So word of mouth and the like, the old fashioned ways of spreading things, uh, you know, are, are still there. They just think those methods are swamped by the, the power of the internet. Well, ha having followed the advice of the day and played that little portion of whatever album it was backwards, it definitely said Paul is dead. Um, that's a well-known fact. Um, uh, we have time for one last question, um, uh, and this is an interesting one because maybe it um, gives us uh, a basis for hope. Uh, and that comment and question is the um, FDR's New Deal approach to building trust was to provide widespread benefits, are not heavy investment in job producing programs addressing climate change a way to produce public trust? Anybody like to make some final comments? addressing that yeah i saw this comment in the chat earlier and i really like it because i do think it speaks to how creative we're going to have to get to it to, to successfully intervene to promote trust and so um one so i do think this is like uh, would be an important program that could that could uh, increase trust and sort of decrease the the conspiratorial thinking for a few reasons so tim when he was answering the question about whether there's like an economic predictor of belief in conspiracy theories it's right that like there's no education or um, economic predictor, but there is one that about uh, economic insecurity. And so even if you're not particularly, um, even if you're quite well off, if you've had a bankruptcy in your background or in your past or have, have sort of lost a job or had a parent who lost a job, that does seem like it predicts um, a belief in conspiracy theories. So this kind of pre economic precarity could be, could play a role. And then addressing that economic precarity through government policies could be a way of promoting trust. But I think there's also going to be ways that we can increase trust that have nothing to do with, or that are have less to do with the sort of um, direct beliefs that people have about the power structures that be or the economic policies that are at play. I think a lot will have to do with just sort of increasing trust within between individuals. So I think someone in the chat also talked about storytelling as a way of promoting trust. And I think I think that's an, also a really important uh, thing that uh, uh, thing that we should rely on. So right now we use social media to engage with people um, who are our friends and our social networks and people who share our beliefs that by strangers. But social media can also be used to make strangers into friends that have nothing to do with their political beliefs or conspiratorial thinking. And there might be ways of using those kind of using social media to increase these kinds of relationships, right? Sort of genuine friendship without intervening about their direct beliefs about the sort of state of affairs of the world or climate change or QAnon at all. And that could also be a way of getting people to sort of break down their barriers, be more uh, receptive to other people's information. And that could be a really effective way of um, kind of breaking down these echo chambers too. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I guess it's a 105. Um, and so I'm obliged to, to end this uh, at this point. Um, once again, I wanted to thank uh, Hannah, Mark, and Tim for making the time for today's uh, set of presentations. I wanted to thank everybody in the audience for also taking the time to tune in. Uh, I hope to see you all back here on uh, March 25th. 
uh, when we're going to be talking about calculating the costs of climate change. So everybody stay healthy, have a great day, and see you next time. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.